What's good, my ballers? Welcome to a special edition of the All Ball Podcast. I'm your host, Nate J, And like every week, I appreciate each and every one of you for joining me today. Today is a very special episode. We have an important conversation that needs to be had. But before we get into that, be sure to follow our Instagram page at the All Ball Podcast for all your sports news and the latest content from the podcast, as well as our YouTube page for full length interviews and other video content you won't want to miss. Now, I think I can speak for most of us when I say this past week has been eye opening and enlightening. We're all watching what's happening in the US, and this notion of Canada is not racist popped up a few times. And now we're hearing how untrue that statement really is. I can tell you from first hand experience that I was racially profiled at the age of 15. Heading to football practice, the all too common phrase, I fit the description, which resulted in several SWAT officers with semi automatic weapons arresting me as some of my friends, teachers, and peers from my school passed by. After that encounter, I remember going to football practice and sharing my experience with my teammates, and sadly, nobody was surprised. The experience, thankfully, did not end how so many other stories do, but it has stuck with me as one of the most dehumanizing and humiliating experiences I've had to date. We are long overdue globally for this change and I am encouraged and inspired by the dialogue happening everywhere. Some of the most inspiring people in the conversation are scholars who dedicate their lives to the study and advancement of our society. When things began escalating week after week, most of us have been talking to our family and friends and asking questions. I am very lucky to have a bright young mind in my own family, Dr. Bidor Allegro. And she has agreed to share her insight with not only me, but all of you ballers out there. So grab a pen, take some notes because you are in for a good one. All right, with everything going on in the world right now, a lot of information and misinformation going around. I think it's important we have someone on who's an expert in this field. Our guest this week received her PhD from the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University and is now a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. You may have noticed she looks alarmingly similar to my wife, and that's because, in fact, she is my sister-in-law. And I think I need a PhD myself for successfully reading your bio. But nevertheless, (laughs) how are you doing, Doc, if I can call you that? Hi. Yeah, I'm doing okay. And just for the people out there, you know, I I am not Melody. I know the photo <laughs> is confusing, but I am a I'm a different person. I am not Melody. Just a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for clearing that up because a lot of people yeah. were hitting me up like, yo, she looks like your wife, man. What's going on? Are you trying to pull a fast one? But thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> So the first yeah. thing I want to ask you is uh, how, how do you consume like all that's going on right now? Because for me personally, like when I watch football or other sports, I see things that you know, a regular fan may not see just for the simple fact that I played the game for so long. But being an expert in this field, like how do you consume all the news coming out, all the protests and everything that's going on? Well, I mean, first I'll say that, you know, like nobody is really an expert. People are simply just experts in the things that they live and experience the most. And so I think right now, it's been very overwhelming um, trying to um, consume things critically because of the overwhelming volume of information that people are being bombarded with. And even me, you know, someone who, you know, I, every single day I, I read and I study these things for a living. It can be really, really overwhelming and kind of mystifying and discombobulating to kind of think about how to parse out the information that's, that's, um, that's useful, how to, you know, think about what's misinformation or disinformation. It's all, it can be really overwhelming. And so there, I want whoever is listening to know that it's it's very normal to feel that way because there is a lot of information coming at us all at once. Trust me, I'm in that group where, you know, I don't have the background that you have. Obviously, I'm not an expert in this field and I I see things happening. I have a ton of questions and uh, that's why I'm so thankful that you're able to join us because, you know, we have a real 
you know, you study these things, like you said, like if someone has a question about, you know, football, they, you know, you can ask me because this is what I do on a daily basis. So it's important to have, you know, someone like you, uh, expert to give our, our listeners, um, you know, a, a point of view from, from experience on your part. Um, for our listeners, um, who I like to call ballers, since this is the all ball podcast, uh, oh, who are okay. being bombarded by information of, uh, from all types of sources, can you please explain the context of the current protests that are happening in the world? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, a, a little over a week ago, um, we saw the really awful and terrible video footage of, of the lynching of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I personally didn't watch it because I don't I um, refuse to consume those types of images, um, but specifically of him being murdered by four police officers who held his body down while one officer held his knee on his neck for roughly nine minutes. Um, and the officers weren't charged at first, and this led to protests in Minneapolis, which soon spread throughout the country and internationally as well. And so what began as a call for the arrest of the officers, which took a really long time, right, eventually turned into a kind of more broad-based struggle against policing and additionally, we can't forget that we had the murders of Ahmaud Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, Tony McDade, who was a um, black trans man in Tallahassee, Florida, and the ongoing investigations into the death of Regis Korchinski Paquette, who was allegedly pushed from her balcony by Toronto police during a wellness check here in Toronto, right? So all of these things combined with the fact that there's been mass layoffs and unemployment due to COVID-19 and mounting frustrations concerning especially the U.S.'s policy of kind of leaving people out to dry during this terrible time, um, this has all been compounded by, again, the always already existing policing violence that people, especially Black people, experience here in the U.S. And so all of this basically created a kind of a powder keg for the protests that we're witnessing right now. Wow. Um, and then you talk about the protesters. What are some of the specific demands of these protesters? What are they asking for and from who? So each city has its own way of organizing protests, and it should be understood that most of the demands are local in particular to the circumstances and the context of a given city. Um, but in general, protesters have been asking for, um, aside from you know wanting the officers to be charged, we've been seeing increasing calls for abolition. And ab abolition is, um, it basically consists of, on the one hand, uh, defunding certain institutions, and on the other hand, um, putting our energy, imagination, resources um, and our time into imagining and building the kinds of lives and futures that we want for ourselves as black people and for everybody as well and so the first part which is defunding means literally just taking the funds out of prisons and policing and putting them into things that affirm and support and nurture um, our lives and that means you know redistributing the resources which is billions of dollars right um, and redistributing them into mental health support education housing food programs, all of these things, which really give people a way to live a dignified life on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the other portion of abolition is really the work of thinking, imagining, and creating different ways of living together in this world. Because the real question is not simply, can we abolish the police? The real question is, how are we gonna live together on this planet, right? And that is a core part of abolition, and that's where a lot of the work and energy um, is being focused and needs to remain focused as well. And with those demands being made, do you, do you think if the protesters actually get the result, you think it will make a difference? Like, what's your thought on that? Um, I think, I think anything, I think if we, if there's a will, if there's like a political will and actual organizing, we can make things happen, right? Um, and so the question is, how do we generate that kind of will among people, right? And also politicize people with the information and the knowledge that they need in order to kind of dismantle these systems. I think if both of those things are present, then, then anything is really possible. Um, but those things take time and they take a lot of patience and they also take, like I said, the will and the right kind of politics to make them happen. So. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, there's been a lot of debate about looting and uh, protests turning violent. What do you say about those who criticize some of the actions of the protesters over the last week? 
Um, okay. So I think, I think it's important to remember the way that especially the United States, but other places as well, um, how they portray looting and how they conceive of what constitutes looting, right? Because, you know, you and I are old enough to remember Hurricane Katrina in 2005, right? And I think we all, well, I think we were probably 15 at that time. So we all remember watching, right, survivors of the hurricane who had been, you know, wading in flood water with dead bodies, right? Trying to find stores so they could get food and medical supplies, right? And being met by police because they were being accused of looting. Like these are people who are in need and suffering under the worst ecological catastrophe that we've seen in our lifetime. And they were called looters, right? And I think one example that comes to mind was, um, you know, the survivors that attempted to cross the Danzig Bridge in New Orleans um, in order to get food and medical supplies, and they were shot by the New Orleans police because they had suspected them of looting, right? So this is, this is the way that the United States has presented the problem of looting. The problem of looting has always been one of viewing people in need, right? and doing something to address that need as looting. Um, so that's the context I think we need to understand the way that looting has been crafted, especially in the media. But what looting really is, is looted land from indigenous people, looted labor and lives of black people for hundreds of years on this continent. We also need to talk about the fact that 40 million people are out of work in this country and standing in lines at food banks, right? Hospital workers and restaurant employees are exposing themselves to COVID because the government decided to bail out corporations instead of giving needed funds to medical and frontline workers to pr protect themselves, right? Looting is a system where Jeff Bezos made billions of dollars during a pandemic, right? And is on track to become a trillionaire because he monetized this crisis that people are suffering under, right? That is looting. Looting is what Capitalism subjects working people to every single day, right? So even if every single storefront was smashed and every single item stolen, right, it wouldn't amount to a decimal or a fraction of what's been taken from ordinary Black and Indigenous people and what continues to be taken from us today, right? And we also have to remember that destruction of property is not violence, right? Destruction of property is actually one of the oldest and most durable forms of nonviolent protest, right? There's actually no such thing as violence against property. Property isn't people, mm -hmm. right? Property against violence is not a thing. It doesn't exist. So that's what I would say. Wow, <laughs> to those that, you, know, you really opened my eyes for sure. Um, okay. Why do you think these protests or this movement has taken the world by storm the way it has because like we've seen you know black men get killed before black women get killed before but it hasn't taken on this kind of life and this kind of energy why this one in particular so i think every protest movement that emerges is both old and new at the same time right you can see the way prior forms of radicalism um, are kind of embedded in movements. And then you can also see how they're being transformed at the very same time and made new again. And I think this is another example of that. So you can see all the elements of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement that emerged a few years ago, um, combined with the already, you know, decades long work of prison abolitionists, right, that has, that's been going on, um, combined with, you know, you know, the, the, the um, Black Panther Party's 10-point uh, program, right, um, for social, economic, um, political um, self-determination for Black people, elements of the civil rights movement, like all of these things are carried forward and embedded and kind of carried forward, even if it's traces, right? But what I think is different about right now, we are in the middle of a pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in 100 years, right? People are really suffering. We also have a fascist in the White House. And that's not to say that the White House itself isn't already a kind of fascist space. And it really doesn't matter who occupies it, right? Because the structure is so durable. But we have a president, right, who has really blown the lid off of that fascist politics, right? And has no problem lifting the veil on it. So I think combined with this kind of, the way that people are really suffering, people are dying. 100,000 people 
are dead from COVID-19. <laughs> People are out of work. They've been locked in the house, unable to meet their basic needs for months, right? And I think these are the conditions for, for again, a powder keg. So, yeah. So since this is a sports podcast, I have to see what yeah. role sports <laughs> plays in this. Um, so protests, for the most part, have had a huge role to play in politics, and especially black athletes who've long had a role to play in protest movements. Can you name a few examples for our ballers? Yeah, well, so I think um, the connection between sports and politics is important because we know that a lot of times culture does the work of politics in so many ways, right? And sports play a huge role in that. And we can think even about, you know, like the U.S. occupation of the Dominican Republic in Haiti nearly 100 years ago and the way that baseball was used as a tool of American propaganda, right, to loop ordinary people in America and in those occupied places, loop them in and bind them to this political project of occupation, right? And so the same goes for football and baseball in America, right? Like these are the hallmarks of like Americana, right? They are some of the biggest carriers of American culture, especially the very worst parts, you know, of American culture, right? So sports institutions are really mobilized to diffuse these, these cultural and political impositions. But also, like you said, importantly, there are scores of athletes who have been incredibly visible in protest movements. So we can't forget Tommy Smith and John Carlos in 1968, you know, raising a fist on the podium uh, at the Olympics in Mexico City. Of course, there's Muhammad Ali, who is, I think, the most ubiquitous kind of sports protest figure. Um, People like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right, who has always been a really vocal critic of racism and has written and spoken about it extensively. Um, We can't forget Bill Russell, right, who, again, was really vocal about the racist treatment he received while playing for the Boston Celtics, to the point that when his jersey was retired in 1972, he requested an empty stadium because he felt that being cheered on by fans wouldn't be representative of the overwhelmingly terrible treatment he received as a player in the city of Boston, right? So he requested an empty stadium. Wow, wow, I did not know that. And I view that very much, yeah. So I view that very much as as an act of protest as well. We also can't forget uh, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf in the 1990s, right, who refused to stand for the national anthem. Um, And he was a basketball player in the NBA. And he was fined heavily, and he proceeded then to not sing the national anthem and choose instead um, to use that time to make dua or pray, right? We can't forget Colin Kaepernick, right, and his kneeling protests against police brutality. But I also think that we should remember that people like Marshawn Lynch have been sitting out the national anthem for a very long time. Right. And so that's not necessarily a new thing, even inside the NFL. And I also want to remind folks that in 2016, WNBA players on the Minnesota Lynch, interestingly enough, right, were fined for wearing T-shirts supporting Black Lives Matter, while NBA players who did the same weren't fined. Right. So I think that's about 1968 to today. It's a long time. Right. At least in terms of the way that protest has been documented. But of course, it's been happening much longer than that. You know, funny thing about the Lynx in uh, 2016, uh, I was reading about it a little bit and the police actually stopped working for the team after that. They had, uh, been, they walked had a off contract. The job. Yeah, they walked off the job. Yeah. So I thought that was very telling, especially with what happened with the University of Minnesota this uh, past couple of weeks with with them, you know, basically severing ties, uh, yeah. severing their ties. Exactly. Um, and Minnesota. But at public schools as well, which is an also a, a, a big win for organizers and protesters in Minnesota. Absolutely. Many athletes have made statements of protests. What do you make of the likes of, you know, guys like, you know, Drew Brees recently, Dak Prescott and other yeah. guys who made statements <laughs> about, about the protests? What, what's, what are your thoughts on those guys? Um, so... <laughs> there's always going to be like a majority of athletes who come out in favor of the status quo. Right. So like we have to remember that a lot of athletes are millionaires, right. Or at least doing better than your ordinary person, especially black people working kind of like minimum wage. So I think we shouldn't number one, look to athletes or other celebrities to express our politics or our political demands for us. Um, that includes Colin Kaepernick. Right. I mean, as, as wonderful as his protests 
are. He is still someone who, who does not relate necessarily to the ordinary working person. And he should take his lead from those people rather than vice versa. Um, not that he doesn't, but I'm saying the way the optics work. Um, and number two, if these athletes do express their politics, uh, we have to ask, are they harnessing certain moments and turning it towards their more privileged class interests? Or are they actually engaged with what ordinary people are demanding, right? Those are the questions we should ask when we see a pro, um, athlete engaging in protests, right? Um, and athletes are in a strange kind of bind and contradiction, especially black athletes, right? Because on the one hand, again, they have a relatively privileged class position. Um, but on the other hand, their structural relationship to the owners of the teams and the league commissioners is super imbalanced and asymmetrical, right? And they're often treated like cattle and flesh without minds. So they're in this double bind that on the one hand places them in a position to empathize with ordinary people if they want to. But in most cases, people tend to side with their class interests first and foremost, right? So it's actually not too surprising that even a black athlete like De Dak Prescott would be making these kinds of statements. Um, and then sometimes um, you get people like the ones I mentioned already who break the status quo, but largely, you know, athletes um, tend to be in favor of the status quo in the same way that most kind of elites or privileged people, celebrities, et cetera, are, right? Um, we can think even of, you know, George Foreman, even in 1968, right? Just a few days after John Carlos and Tommy Smith had raised their fists, right? And the entire Black diaspora was animated by this gesture. You know, George Foreman, days later, stood on the podium and waved an American flag, right? And it was a real disrespect to the sacrifice that Tommy Smith and John Carlos had made. And then in a statement later, he said that if he'd had two flags, he would have raised two flags, right? So there are always people willing to be co-opted in the service of maintaining these structures, right? Of course, there's people like Michael Jordan, <laughs> right? Who mm -hmm. frankly does not care about black people. He cares about the almighty dollar, right? OJ Simpson, right? Who, these are people who are content to collect their checks and didn't really care to comment on what black people were experiencing. So I'd say Dak Prescott is an example of a much larger predicament, you know, that black athletes find themselves in. And many of them tend to, again, turn towards their own class interests. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's that's a lot of history and knowledge you just dropped. And <laughs> it's gonna take some time for me to process all that, but that was that was definitely mind blowing. What what do you make of the statements offered by the pro teams, pro pro sports teams, and uh, the leagues in general? Have you seen any of them? Yeah, I've seen a few of them, and I. You know, for me personally, they can, you know, keep these statements themselves. Like, it doesn't really matter to me what leagues are. So now is no different from the past. They are corporations and they're going to protect their dollar. And I think right now they might be afraid, right, that their bottom line might be impacted or that players might start to undermine their dollar or their bottom line. So I don't know if you all remember, but in 2015, um, when a lot of students on campuses were protesting against racism, the thing that actually tipped the scales was football players at the University of Missouri, they went on strike and they refused to play a game and the school lost a million dollars on that one day. And after that, everything changed, right? So I think team owners and leagues know, right? That if players are upset, they have to try and pacify it in one way or another because it will hurt their bottom line, right? And I think that's where a lot of these statements are coming from. And again, we don't need any corporation to kind of co-opt a movement or tell us what our politics are. We already see it with police co-opting protests and co-opting Kaepernick's dissent. Like you see police kneeling and, and it's absolutely absurd, right? It makes no sense. And these are attempts to kind of distract and tame these movements and to quell the really quite righteous anger that people are displaying right now. Um, and we shouldn't fall for it, right? We should remember that de the demand is abolition. The NFL, which is one of the most racist institutions in America, donating money is not abolition, right? Even giving Kaepernick a job is not abolition, right? Working with Jay-Z, who is a billionaire, is not abolition. Only abolition is abolition. And even more, you know, Roger Goodell, you know, making that statement that Black Lives Matter is certainly not enough. And I would argue that 
that it's an insult to use that phrase to get the heat off his back. Meanwhile, the, co the league colluded against Colin Kaepernick and treats its black players like cattle, right? Like we have, this is a league that's 70% black players, which means that all of the problems of the league, the refusal, for example, to adequately support players living with head injuries, right? That's one example. All the problems on the league, therefore, falls disproportionately on black players. So if he wants to say, like if Roger Goodell really wants to say Black Lives Matter, he can spend less time talking to Jay-Z about it and more time actually addressing his league's really shameful record when it comes to black players. Mm, mic drop. I think the problem with, <laughs> with that is Roger Goodell represents the owners right so he is trying to play both sides where he represents the owners but i think inside he knows uh kaepernick should be playing i think he knows the, it really wasn't wrong for the players to be kneeling but who pays them is the owners so that is where he's kind of yeah. stuck and he's always going to look like the bad guy in that situation <laughs> He's going to look like the bad guy because maybe he's been a bad guy. That's also an option, right? It, it's not always the case. You know, I think, I think that when people show us who they are, we should believe them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if it's the case that Roger Goodell has been making bad policy decisions inside the NFL as it pertains to Black people, it's probably because that's what he feels and thinks. And we can only assume that he feels differently if he says so and if he acts differently. That's the only thing we can go off of, right? And so that's that's another thing is like we are so willing to give these corporations and these billionaires the benefit of the doubt, but no benefit of the doubt in a similar way is extended to people really calling for justice and abolition and putting their lives on the line to stare down police guns, you know? And so I wish the same kind of compassion and grace was extended to everyday ordinary people, you know? Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, so I don't know if you've seen the past couple of days, a lot of coaches and people in the sports industry have been kind of called out for their past uh, actions, uh, past racist actions. Um, yeah. And I think we kind of saw this too with the Me Too movement where people were kind of called out for their past actions and lost their jobs or had to make statements. You think this you know, current climate that we're in is – it's going to be similar to that Me Too movement where if you've ever been racist, you, you probably better watch out because you, you probably will get exposed. Um, so I think that on the one hand, like it's important to call out these actions wherever we see them in the moment. You know, I think it's more useful to call them out in the moment rather than, you know, 20 years, 10 years, even five years down the line. I think if we're all doing our part, then that won't be a problem, right? Um, but I also think that racism is so incredibly pervasive. It's so embedded in the very bedrock and foundation of every single institution on this planet, really, right? That you would, if you were to try and call out every single, you would just, there's not enough time in the day to do it, right? The end, the best way, the most durable way is to organize, right? And try to dismantle these institutions and replace them with things that affirm and protect and nurture Black people's lives, right? That's, that's the real work to be done. Um, and I'm not saying that if you have a colleague or someone close to you or even someone who's a public figure that you shouldn't call them out on their racism, but that always has to accompany that organizing work. Right. And I think what happened with the Me Too movement is that it got easily co-opted again by elites. And so these elites felt that by putting someone on Front Street, they were doing the work. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily the work in its totality that needs to be done. Um, and so, yeah, I think keeping your keeping your eye on the real work that needs to be done while also being ethical, right? And saying that if I see something, say something, <laughs> you know, those are, and also we also have to build in protections for each other because when we call things out, right, it's not usually the person who suffers, it's the person who does the calling out that yeah. suffers. That's, how, that's the way it works. The retaliation certainly doesn't usually work in the way that it ought to, right? So what protections are we building in for each other so that if I put my neck out and I say something, is my community or are my people going to kind of be there and catch, catch me or provide me with the supports that I need? Should I lose everything for it, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, so since I announced that you're going to be on this podcast, I'd have a lot of people reach out to me and ask me, so what, what could they do to contribute? What could they do to help the cause? Um, I want you to tell our sports fans, our listeners, our ballers, uh, what they can do to educate themselves and contribute towards the activism that's going on right now. And, and what can they do to make sure this continues into the future and isn't just, you know, something in the moment? Um, so basically there are a few things that everyone can do. Um, so in the immediate sense, you can contribute to local bail funds for protesters. And these bail funds have popped up in pretty much every major city where these protests are happening. Um, another thing you can do is donate to mutual or mutual aid organizations and food banks servicing people in need because we continue to deal with the repercussions of COVID-19, which disproportionately impacts Black people. Mm -hmm. um, you can also start to educate yourself and other people around you about policing, um, about abolition. There are really great online resources that are circulating right now from organizations like Survive and Punish, Project Mia, BYP 100. So start educating yourself. Talk to your friends, your peers, your family. Start politicizing people now. The time is right now, and we can't wait. So those are the things that I would suggest. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'll make sure to make a note of that and get that out to everybody that's been asking for sure. Um, so older generations talk about, you know, Gen Z, the generation right now <laughs> being snowflake, soft, whatever you want to say. Uh, what are the defining features you see in teaching this group that makes them the ones that can finally make real change? Um, I think, I think every generation has a part to play, right? So I don't want to like make any one age group seem like singular or not connected from the rest of our community or even place the burden, right, of liberation on one particular age group. Like it's really all of our job, but I have to say the creativity that's being displayed by young people is something that is absolutely like remarkable to watch. Um, like, I don't know if you saw, but you know, um, the po there was a, a police department, I can't remember which city, but there was a police department that um, was taking calls and receiving, um, uh, asking for footage and surveillance footage of protesters, right? Yeah. So you could identify them and put them in jail. And then young K-pop fans flooded their um, flooded their line with um, fan cams, right? <laughs> and so people couldn't actually use this like snitch line that had been wow. developed. They shut it down basically. They flooded it with like their fan cams of like their favorite K-pop acts, and they rendered the line completely useless. I mean, like these are the things that young people are doing that absolutely blow my mind. Like the creativity is absolutely astounding. So that's one thing I'm really impressed with. <laughs> Yeah, that, okay, that's, that's awesome. Like to think that <laughs> they're trying to look at footage and they're, they're watching K-pop. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's the thing, right? It shows that like anybody can do something like from any place from which you're entering, this kind of thing is a possible opening, you know? Like yeah. from wherever you enter, you can do something. Yeah, um, art, imagery, and culture is a big thing in past revolutions and movements from Marvin Gaye to Rosie the Riveter. Um, how would you say memes will go down to history? <laughs> because right now we're in the meme revolution and, you know, are we going to be helping Layla with their homework and they're going to have memes in textbooks? Like what, what's, what's next for the memes? I hope memes are in textbooks. Let me tell you something. These memes, well, first of all, I think it reminds me of like, like, um, last year during the revolution in Sudan and the way that memes, right, were like yes. mobilized as a way to critique the state in really poignant and cogent ways and to disseminate information. Yes. Um, satire yes. and politics have always gone together, right? And memes are simply a kind of extension of that relationship. But what I think is so especially useful about memes, right, is that in the same way that like political cartoons are used, right, to critique the state and also veil the person that's making the critique, right? Similar way that memes are being mobilized. Um, the memes are able to politicize people. Some of these memes carry a lot of information in a really sh like small like mm -hmm. image, right? And and it's also like a bomb for people. Like people are finding comfort and laughter and humor via these memes. So it's important for that reason too. I mean. 
I really hope memes make it into textbooks. <laughs> Some of these memes are art. Really, they are art and they are what, knowledge. They what, what's been knowledge. your favorite meme so far? Um, well, I mean, I think everyone probably would agree that this meme is like my, it's like a really good one. And I can say this now because the young woman has come out and said that she's fine after this intro action that she had with the police so that's why i'm mentioning it but the the you about to lose your job song <laughs> remix oh yeah. fantastic We're so gonna, and she can't she came out and said um you know that um she's okay and you know so i feel okay mentioning it but a lot of the memes have been really really fantastic i mean another meme that i really like is the um you know all these politicians um and liberals coming out and showing their support for you know the protests and then people responding saying is this you and it shows them in a, either a photo or a tweet that they had um, oh. that's like deeply racist. Yeah, that's, that's another that's another favorite meme of mine. Oh, man. <laughs> I love I love the callouts. Um, speaking of social media memes, you on I think it was Monday or Tuesday where it was, oh yeah blackout blackout Tuesday right yeah where everybody had the black boxes and and everybody was posting yeah. that. What was your take on that? Because I know you know talking to Melody, she didn't agree with it. But what was your yeah. your take on that? So my take on that is that silence should never be an option in the midst of incredible political um, turmoil, and especially when the state is displaying enormous acts of violence against people. That is the worst time to go silent about anything, right? And this is the way that movements are interrupted and co-opted and infiltrated, right? Um, And this was, a, uh, I think, an... um, what do you call it? Like a campaign that was like really being heavily promoted by like celebrities and musicians, which is why we don't need to listen to them for our politics. Right. Because I mean, it can be really harmful, right? They don't necessarily have, they're not necessarily politicized in the way they need to be before making these statements, but they reach millions of people. Right. So one celebrity says tweet a black box and then millions of people follow them afterwards, not thinking about the political consequences of what they're doing. Right. And so what we had was, you know, you scroll the hashtag of Black Lives Matter and all you see these black boxes instead of the crucial information that people really need, right? And that's why it's important, again, the political education component, really becoming knowledgeable about these movements and plugging in with local organizers, right? Because if you do that, then it becomes clear as day, right? That something like that is actually undermining what people are doing right now rather than helping or assisting. Mm, makes sense because honestly i'll be honest when i first saw it i was quick to be like oh i'm part of this i want to help i want to do whatever i can right and sometimes you do stuff and you don't really think about the meaning behind it like i literally posted it and melody woke up minutes later and was like take that down i'm about to unfollow you (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm gonna follow you right now so before i did (laughs) yeah it explained to me you know the meaning behind it and why it shouldn't be up so um, thank you for explaining that. And um, also, I want to ask you about, so we didn't get into this enough, but Cap, what what do you think um, like NFL owners or even you know, the league in general is thinking about his actions before? Because he's got to be looking at it like I was right. And now I'm Didn't happy you guys you? are finally <laughs> seeing that I was right. Yeah. Um. You know, I don't actually know. I haven't, I don't know what, what Cap has said about what's going what what the league owners and um, the league itself. He, he can't like say anything, right? Because they he can't because of the yeah. lawsuit. Um, but, you know, I think for us, the focus should be the issue, right? Which is policing violence mm-hmm. um, and uh, the way that police exact extraordinary violence and uh, force against Black people in particular in America, right? And so again, the issue should not be, should Kaepernick be able to protest or not? That's one part of a big constellation of issues. And the the main issue, right, is that which he is protesting, which is the policing and other forms of violence that Black people experience every day in America, right? So even though this must be a moment where he might feel vindicated, I still think that he's not the focus. He's not the issue, right? The issue itself is the issue. And so I would want to encourage people to stay focused on on the issue. It's really easy to get caught up and pulled into um, these really extraordinary examples of protest and the optics of it. But again, the issue should always remain at the forefront. 100%. And the reason I asked is because, you know, this is 
a sports podcast. So I want yeah. to give, you know, kind of the sports lens on it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I asked. So sure. doc, thank you so much as we near the end. And since this is a sports podcast, like I mentioned, um, Oh wait, can I say one more thing just to the listeners oh, sure. out there? Yeah. One more thing is I want to say is, in general, don't fall for the jig, right? If you see people kind of virtue signaling about the need to be peaceful, if you see marches for peace or marches for change kind of popping up that like are looking to separate themselves from the rebellions that have been happening, if you see protesters hugging cops or kneeling with them, if you see celebrities and other you know, elites trying to tell people how they should and shouldn't protest, just know that these are all distractions, right? The only violence that's being perpetrated right, is by the state. The only peace that can actually come is with a full concession to the demands of the people that began their protests on that night in Minnesota, what, 12 days ago and even before that. So avoid the distractions and plug in with the people and organizations that have already been doing the work for a very long time. So that's like my last word. That's that's awesome. And I was definitely going to give you the floor to, you know, just get your thoughts out there. But what Okay, so I'm seeing, sometimes I've seen images of like bricks, like random bricks out um, around these protests. What are your, what, where are those coming from? Because I don't know. Where are those coming from? If you know, what, I don't what know. are those I, they represent? <laughs> like what's going on with that? I don't know either. But what I can say is that a lot of what's happening right now um, is that kind of liberals and people who haven't been involved in organizing for a long time and people who are, you know, um, new to a lot of these issues, they're starting to scapegoat people like anarchists, for example, as the problem, right? Blaming quote unquote anarchists for, you know, what's been happening, the kind of Uh, destruction of property, so to speak, right? And anyone who knows anything about anarchism knows that, you know, most anarchists are actually busy, you know, feeding people and providing services to people and not actually doing, you know, these things. And so that's one thing, one bit of disinformation that I want to clear up. But also, um, I think, again, these are all really distractions. The focus should be on the issues. The focus should not be on telling people how and when and where and why and the manner in which they should protest. The focus should be should remain on the issue at hand. And the issue is state violence being enacted on people. And we have to maintain that clarity or else we get bogged down in a lot of these conversations that take up our energy, take up our time, take up our bandwidth, take up our space online, right? And don't actually get us further in our cause, right? So, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Seriously, like, honestly, like, I... I'm always wondering like what's going on and honestly you you cleared that up to a T. All right, so like I said, this is a sports podcast, so be doer, it is game time. Let's get ready to rumble. Okay, so okay. <laughs> I hope you're ready. Here's a game I like to call Name the Ball. So I'm going to give you uh, options of player names and you have to tell me whether they play football or basketball. Okay. So for example, I'll say, um, are they from the nineties? If they're from the (laughs) nineties, I'll say Michael Jordan. And you have to tell me (laughs) is it a basketball player or a football player. Okay. Okay. And you know who that is, right? Okay. Okay. Whatever. (laughs) I know who Michael Jordan is. Uh, All right. So the first one and and the rules are you have five seconds, you know, to tell me what is a basketball player or football player. And uh, we'll see how you do. Okay, you ready? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay the first one I have will start you off nice and easy. An alley oop, LeBron James. Basketball, of course. <laughs> okay. Come on, hey, like. The second one, another. We gotta get start slow. We can't throw you the the fastballs right away. Okay. The second one, Tom Brady. Five seconds. Football, basketball. Football. I thought this was gonna be a game. Oh, it, it's gonna be okay. Hard. You're getting cocky. Okay, <laughs> you're getting cocky. Um, hit Lamar Jackson. Is he a football player? You have five seconds. Is he a football? I'm going to I'm going to say football. Okay, you're right. You didn't know, oh, but you have a 50/50 chance, so yeah, we, we all can tell you didn't know that one. Okay. <laughs> the next one, CJ McCollum. CJ McCollum. You know, that gives me football vibes. I'm going to say football player. 
I love it. I love it. And I want to say you're wrong because CJ oh. McCollum is a guard for the Portland Trail Trailblazers. Oh my God, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> so embarrassing. It's okay. You're like you said, you're an expert in in a particular field, and most experts are experts in their field for a reason. So I stopped I don't watching sports you. in like 2005. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what happens when you're busy getting PhDs and, and uh, becoming a doctor. So, um, I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> the the next one we have is DeAndre Hopkins. I'm gonna say football. You're correct. That's good, what? and you were very confident. I don't know if you know who he is, but that I you, don't know who he is. <laughs> 50-50. All right. Next one. Rondé Hollis Jefferson. Rondé Hollis Jefferson. Sounds like a law he, firm. Does sound like a law firm. <laughs> is, he a, is he a football player? Definitely sounds like a football player, but he plays for your Toronto Raptors. Unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. That's so embarrassing. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. Okay. Everyone in Toronto. I'm really we... sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who he is. We got a couple more here. Um, the God. next one we have is Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan? That sounds like a football player. It is a football player. Quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, okay. Last one. I will. We will do here unless you want to do a couple more because I got a whole list, but I don't want no, to keep too long. Um, Devin Booker. Football or basketball player? Is he a basketball player? You tell me. I think he's a basketball player. Okay. You are correct. He is a basketball yeah. player. That is a great guess. I know you <laughs> guessed all these because there's no Wait, way you know any of these guys. What, what's my total? Your total, you have, you're actually, let me calculate. You want to do a couple more and I'll calculate them? Sure. Why not? Okay. Um, the next one is LaMarcus Aldridge. Ball player. You're right. I've You're heard right. of him before. You're actually doing a lot better than I thought. This is wow, unbelievable. Wow, thank you. <laughs> you know what? It's 50-50. We're going to go one last one. You have a great record. Let's see. Tyree okay. Kill. Tyree Kill? Yes. I've heard his name before, which means he must play basketball. I don't watch football. You're right. Okay. See? No, you're right. No, 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 I'm saying you're right. You might, you heard his name before, but you're actually wrong. He plays football. Oh, I don't watch football. Where did I hear his name? <laughs> you did really well, though. You did really well. You got one, two, five, six right, and three wrong. Oh, oh look at that. Look at amazing. I, I am wow. so surprised. Look at that. <laughs> Because <laughs> I know you didn't know any of these guys, and for you to get that many right, I didn't count LeBron, but yeah, to get that I'm going to take right. your job, Tay. Watch out. <laughs> Coming well, I won't job. be taking your job, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but, Bidor, Doc, thank you so much for coming on and educating us. I learned so much. Like, honestly, like, I feel like. Oh, thank you. I'm actually, you know, deserve a PhD because, you know, I've learned. So much. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, our ballers, I hope they learn as much. I understand you're teaching two free Zoom classes on these topics. So I'm very excited um, to see the outcome. Yeah, it's basically just like a community kind of reading seminar. Um, unfortunately, the class is full right now, but there are lots of ways for folks to educate themselves. So just keep, keep your eyes peeled. Talk to organizers and activists in your community, and they would be more than happy to plug you into to resources and ways that you can get involved with political education. So, Doc, thank you so much for your time. Honestly, you're welcome to thank come you, back Jay. anytime. I know you're not, a, but anytime there's any kind of... I'm uh, sweating. This was like the <laughs> hardest thing I've done. A sports and I appreciate you too, because you've turned down, you turned down CNN, Fox, not NBC CNN. for us. Stop. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> not true. No, seriously. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I know you you said something earlier, but do you have any last words for the listeners before you get out of um, here? Um, no, just you know, keep um vigilant. Um, you know, consume things critically. Watch out for misinformation and disinformation. Um, my friend um Nesma Ahmed, who's um the founder of Digital Justice Lab, um has been doing really great work about explaining misinformation and disinformation. So keep vigilant about that. Keep your spirits up do the work in your local communities, do the work around you first. It takes all kinds of people to build and sustain movements. So get in where you fit in. That's my last word. 
All right. Thank you so much, ballers. That was Dr. Bidur Allegra, University of Texas at Austin. She was wonderful today. Hopefully we can have her back on, but honestly, I don't think we can afford her. Thank you so much, B. <laughs> All right. You take, take care. care. Bye. Bye. All right, that was Dr. Vidor Allegra, professor at the University of Texas. And folks, class was in session. Once again, don't forget to share, rate, and view this podcast, as well as follow us on our IG page at the All Ball Podcast and also our YouTube page. Just type in the All Ball Podcast and you have full access to full length videos and lots of other show content. Before I get out, get out of here, I got to thank all you guys for tuning in each and every week. You guys show up and show out. I appreciate it. Thank you for showing that support. And until next Sunday, no justice, no peace.